So good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, welcome to the fourth and last uh, Galilean lecture by Professor Avi Loeb. And after all these excursions on, on essentially all we know on cosmology, uh, we're looking into the future. So the title of the fourth lecture will be Future Frontiers in Cosmology from a Galilean Perspective. Avi. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, today I will uh, give a lecture that I think uh, Galileo himself would have enjoyed hearing. Um, uh, I will describe uh, future frontiers in cosmology uh, from a Galilean perspective, uh, trying to learn some lessons from uh, scientific work of uh, Galileo. Uh, and uh, one of the most important uh, ingredients of it is that we should not pretend that we know the truth before we actually observe the universe. Um, and so that's a very important lesson to learn, uh, even as we move forward in our knowledge. Uh, we have a lot that we have learned, but we still have a lot that we don't know. Uh, and I'll try to describe uh, two aspects of the future. One is areas um, of uh, cosmology might be most exciting and worth going into, so that's in terms of the content. But the second aspect is uh, the methodology. How do we select the research topic? Uh, how do we move uh, from the mentality of a student that is given uh, a problem to solve to the mentality of a, an adult uh, scientist that has to choose a topic? And that's a very different uh, experience, as we all know. Uh, but I will not pretend that I know the future. Uh, there is a, a quotation from the Talmud uh, by a rabbi that said that uh, following the destruction of the temple, prophecy became the trademark of two categories of people, fools uh, that I don't want to belong to, <laughs> and infants, uh, small babies, uh, and they simply are too naive uh, to uh, be realistic. So they pretend they know the future because they don't have much information. And I, I do not belong to that category either. So I will not try to forecast the future, but will give you sort of general directions that might be of interest. And uh, speaking about Galileo, uh, I would like to mention one quote that will actually follow us through my lectures, through my lecture, um, and that, has, uh, that says the following, in questions of science, the authority of a thousand is not worth the humble reasoning of a single individual. And uh, that is a very uh, important insight, and I will try to emphasize it in my lecture. So let me start with the content. Uh, in the long-term future, and I'm talking about centuries from now, so that's the most difficult to forecast, but let me start from that. What would be the most exciting uh, frontier in astrophysics and cosmology? In my mind, uh, it is uh, biology away from the Earth, and we have a biologist in the audience. And uh, so far, our uh, view of the universe is that of uh, material objects that have no life in them, and that's how we view the ingredients of life and expect to, to forecast the, the future as we do in cosmology these days. So that will be a change in our perception of the universe once we find evidence for life elsewhere. And of course that can be first of all in the solar system, uh, for example Enceladus, uh, uh, a place where people uh, um, think that maybe there is liquid water, uh, there may be also uh, under the ice uh, of uh, Europa, uh, there may be liquid water, uh, and fish may be swimming there. We don't know. There might be also intelligent civilizations somewhere in the solar system. We haven't really explored that. Uh, there might be city lights somewhere in the Kuiper Belt, for example. Uh, of course, uh, what is being explored, the existence of uh, planets elsewhere, uh, outside the solar system, and also Obviously, it would be of interest if we develop techniques that allow us to detect planets outside of our galaxy. 
and in particular habitable planets, planets that can support life as we know it in liquid water. Uh, and of course, uh, we can imagine stars like the sun maturing and becoming white dwarfs. And if our civilization can uh, persist despite all the political problems that we have uh, over billions of years, you can imagine uh, mature civilizations existing around white dwarfs, which is the end uh, product of the evolution of the sun. And it would be easier to search for intelligent civilizations around white dwarfs because uh, the star is not bright anymore. It's fading away. And one can look for um, artificial light emitted from the vicinity of white dwarfs. And of course, these civilizations will have to keep themselves, uh, themselves warm and uh, they will have to illuminate the surface of the planet with artificial light. And to search for intelligent life, would be to uh, eavesdrop on radio and optical signals that come from them. So let me mention one paper that we uh, published uh, just a few months ago with my colleague Ed Turner from uh, Princeton, in which we argued that it's possible in principle to detect with existing instruments to detect uh, artificial light in the solar system. And in fact, uh, the, the technique is quite simple. Imagine that you have an object, uh, such as an asteroid or a minor planet, um, that, uh, uh, for example, there is a city of an extraterrestrial civilization on it. Uh, then, of course, the flux that we observe from it will uh, decline as one over its distance squared. If we place it farther and farther away, just like uh, placing a light bulb far, farther and farther away, uh, the flux that we observe will uh, go down like one over the distance squared. However, if uh, this object simply reflects sunlight, then the situation is different. The uh, amount of sunlight that is being reflected uh, scales as one over distance squared because that's the uh, fraction of the solid angle that is being occupied by the, the object, uh, so basically uh, the fraction of the solar luminosity intercepted by the surface area of the object uh, scales as one over distance squared, but then we observe this reflected light uh, with an extra factor of one over distance squared. So altogether, the flux that we observe from an object that is reflecting sunlight scales as one over distance to the fourth. So here is a simple approach that allows you to distinguish artificial light from reflected sunlight. You just have to monitor the light curve of the object as it moves towards us or away from us within the solar system. And surprisingly, nobody attempted to check that. So I asked uh, uh, people that work uh, on Kuiper Belt, search for Kuiper Belt objects, and I asked them uh, why didn't anyone check whether this is satisfied? And they said, we had no reason. We assumed that it simply reflected sunlight. So uh, people often make the assumption uh, that, ref that the scaling is one over distance to the fourth, but it would be worth checking. And uh, in the coming years, the, there would be a large data set of uh, light curves of uh, objects in the, in the Kuiper Belt. And the interesting point is that with existing telescopes, a city like Tokyo, is a 31st uh, R-band magnitude. Uh, it's detectable, for example, with the Hubble Ultra Deep Field uh, at a distance of 1,000 astronomical units, 1,000 times farther from the sun than the Earth is. So that means that with existing telescopes, we can see a city like Tokyo all the way to the edge of the solar system. But nobody searched so far. And obviously, the likelihood is small. However, uh, as Galileo taught us, uh, it was common sense that heavy objects fall faster than light objects. And that is not the case. So we should not make uh, assumptions. We should just observe if we can. If we have the technology to do something, we should just go ahead and do it and check whether our preconception is right or not. And the same holds, for example, for the new generation of radio observatories that are being developed, and I described those uh, in my second lecture. Uh, they are being developed to map, for example, hydrogen in the early universe. And this is one example, the Murchison Whitefield Array, 
but there is also LOFAR here in Europe. And these are uh, arrays of dipole antenna that are sensitive to frequencies of order hundreds of megahertz. And of course, the first thing you realize once you build such an array is that there is a lot of noise coming from, from us. Uh, if you are building the array close to Sydney, the level of noise is pretty large. And, and this noise is coming from radio and TV broadcasting. So all these uh, spectral lines are specific radio stations near Sydney. And they're just in the same frequency range that one is using to map hydrogen at high redshifts, hundreds of uh, megahertz. Uh, if you go away from Sydney to a smaller, uh, to, to a region that is uh, farther away, uh, the noise goes down, and if you go to the desert, uh, the Australian desert, of course, uh, the noise is quite limited. Uh, but that led me to consider the possibility that these same instruments, the, the arrays that are being developed, will also be sensitive to uh, transmission by extraterrestrial civilizations. So the question is, how far away can we see an object like the Earth um, that is leaking radio waves all the time? And it turns out that uh, it depends really if you consider the signal coming from military radars or from TV uh, radio broadcasting or from uh, FM radio broadcasting. Uh, but uh, the most powerful military radars were used back in uh, after or around the, the Second World War. And if you use the power that they uh, emitted, you find that you can see an Earth-like uh, civilization all the way out to distances of tens of parsecs or um, several tens of uh, uh, light years away, roughly 50 light years away, um, with uh, instruments like uh, MWA or LOFAR. And the interesting point is that we have been uh, broadcasting for about 50 years, so that means that a twin civilization, a copy of our civilization, out to a distance of 50 light years would be visible to this new generation of radio telescopes. And one thing to keep in mind is that uh, the, the most powerful radio transmission came from uh, uh, early warning systems for ballistic missiles during the Cold War. Um, and uh, this means that militant civilizations will probably be the brightest. So we don't want to respond to those if we detect the signal. This is a cautionary remark. Uh, the other, I mean, there is a plus side to receiving a signal from another civilization, and that's the fact that we can ask them uh, about the true nature of dark matter and dark energy. They may have been around for a few billion years, so they know the answer. What is the dark matter? What is the dark energy? Although this would feel like a cheating uh, in an exam. Uh, and uh, there are two versions to, to that experience. Uh, there is a um, secular version where uh, you just copy from your neighbor. Uh, and uh, there is the religious version where there is a supervisor looking at you. And uh, religious people might be more reluctant to ask an extraterrestrial civilization for the answer. Um, OK, uh, other long-term challenges that one can imagine for uh, laboratory experiments. Uh, one is uh, producing the inflaton, the scalar field responsible for inflation. We don't really know what the physics behind inflation is and what the nature of the inflaton is. And the current uh, popular view is that it has to do with the energy scale of grand unified theories, which would be very difficult to reach in the laboratory. But perhaps it was not. Uh, at, at that scale, perhaps it was closer to a TV, which is accessible to laboratory experiments. So um, perhaps the Large Hadron Collider or the future generation of laboratory experiments will give us a hint as to what the inflaton is. An even bigger challenge over the next few centuries would be to perturb the vacuum. We know that the universe has a vacuum energy density that is causing it to accelerate. And we don't understand what it is. It's called dark energy, for lack of better understanding. Uh, and the way, one way to study it would be to perturb it. Uh, we don't know how, but uh, that could be an interesting challenge for future laboratory experiments. 
So let's me, let me move now closer uh, from several centuries from now to several decades from now. Uh, in the intermediate term, what would be the exciting uh, frontiers that we might investigate? Uh, in terms of laboratory experiments, uh, producing or directly detecting the dark matter, uh, if it is indeed particles, uh, would be uh, an achievable challenge. Um, as long as these particles uh, interact to a sufficient level with ordinary matter. Of course, uh, we would like to detect uh, light from uh, extrasolar Earth-like planets so that we can infer the chemistry of the uh, atmosphere. So here I'm not talking about intelligent civilizations, but uh, which in principle are easier to detect, uh, but simply about the chemistry of the atmosphere that may give us a hint as to the existence of primitive life. And that's actually uh, the long-term goal that the, the astrophysics community defined in terms of uh, target uh, uh, for identifying life elsewhere, primitive life, which may be quite common because it started very early as the Earth uh, cooled. And uh, there are plans, but they're not funded at the moment, uh, such as the Terrestrial Planet Finder and Darwin, uh, that technologically, in principle, could allow us to detect the, the light from uh, distant Earth-like uh, planets. Another exciting frontier that is not funded as well, you notice the uh, situation right now that the exciting frontiers are not funded, which perhaps makes sense if uh, the funding agencies are trying to be conservative. But as I'll argue towards the end of my talk, this is not necessarily the right approach. Another exciting uh, frontier is gravitational wave astrophysics. And here we're opening a new window into the universe. Instead of using electromagnetic waves that we have used over the past century to uh, learn about the universe, there is another way to do so uh, using gravitational waves. And the advantage is that all astrophysical objects are optically thin. They are transparent to gravitational waves. So we can actually see uh, the immediate environment, in principle, immediate environment of black hole binaries as they merge, even if those envir environments are being enshrouded by dust and gas. Uh, and also the same holds for the formation process of a black hole at the center of, of a star if it has uh, clumps that generate gravitational waves, or uh, if we want to see how a neutron star in a stellar mass black hole come together and understand better the equation of state of the neutron star matter, uh, gravitational waves offer us uh, a, a way of, of probing that that we cannot really uh, achieve with electromagnetic waves. And uh, advanced LIGO and several other gravitational wave detectors are being this, uh, constructed right now, and they should become operational within a couple of years. So this is not really a dream. Uh, it's being funded, um, and they would allow us to probe uh, low-mass uh, compact objects, such as stellar mass black holes or neutron stars as they merge. But an even more exciting aspect of gravitational wave astrophysics is detecting supermassive black holes, because they span a much larger range of masses and circumstances uh, at the centers of galaxies. And we can, in principle, detect them all the way out to very high redshifts when the very first galaxies formed. Uh, and we can also test the general theory of relativity. Uh, and it's about time for us to, to be able to do that uh, in the strong field regime uh, a century after it was conceived by Einstein. Uh, let me now move on to even closer to the present time the immediate observational frontiers. What are those? Uh, of course, uh, we now have a satellite that is discovering uh, Earth-like planets in the habitable zone uh, of nearby stars. This, the habitable zone is the zone around the star where liquid water may exist on the surface of a planet. So in principle, the chemistry of life may develop around these candidates. And the next challenge would be to find evidence for the chemistry of life in the atmospheres of some of these planets. And perhaps even search for intelligent signals uh, from those planets. 
And the Kepler satellite is the instrument allowing us to get a list of those candidates uh, within 100 parsecs or so from the sun. Uh, and here is uh, a collection, the collection of uh, almost uh, 800 confirmed planets uh, to scale. Uh, and the small box here is the collection of planets in the solar system. And these are the rest that we uh, definitely know about. We don't know whether there is life on any of them, uh, in particular the smallest ones. Most of them are big because they are easier to detect if they are big. So there is a selection effect here. Uh, but that's a beautiful illustration of the variety of planets we already know about, and there are many more out there that uh, Kepler discovered. Another frontier that is in the immediate future, and I mentioned it in my uh, talk yesterday, is imaging black holes, getting a, a photograph of a black hole. And we now have the technology to do that using an array of uh, millimeter observatories. Another immediate frontier is uh, searching for transients, all kinds of explosion, explosions, uh, explosive events in the universe, uh, variable sources that may result either from uh, explosions of stars or from um, tidal disruption of stars by supermassive black holes or some other processes that we haven't imagined yet. And uh, this is simply doing astronomy also in the time domain, so adding a dimension that was previously not really uh, mapped uh, extensively. Uh, we often map sources in uh, the three spatial dimensions but the time dimension is uh, sort of a new frontier that is only being uh, explored extensively right now. And the current instruments are uh, pan stars uh, in Hawaii and the Palomar Transient uh, Factory uh, at uh, Mount Palomar. Uh, and of course, the future is with uh, LSST, the Large Synoptic uh, Survey Telescope. Um, additional Survey uh, telescopes will be associated perhaps within a decade with Euclid and WFIRST. And WFIRST recently was with the possibility of using some spy lenses that the defense industry uh, is willing to give NASA, um, just showing uh, that science is not really the highest priority uh, in terms of funding these days. Um, and of course, one of the main objectives of these uh, is not just finding uh, evidence for transient sources, but uh, more importantly, according to the people that proposed these uh, surveys, uh, it's to uh, perhaps nail down how constant is the ratio between the vacuum pressure and the vacuum energy density. And this is the parameter called W. And the question is, is the vacuum uh, mass density really constant with time or with redshift? Is W constant at a value of minus one? Or is it evolving? And of course, the future of the universe will very much depend on whether it's evolving or it's a constant. But so far, it looks like a constant. And that's what uh, we should expect. Because if you want it to evolve on the Hubble time, then you need to arrange two coincidences. Not just that the vacuum energy density will start dominating recently in the universe, but also that it will evolve on the time scale of the evolution of the universe. And so, in my mind, arranging two coincidences is quite unlikely. And so, uh, most likely, this is a constant of nature, just like the electron mass, uh, as far as we can tell from uh, experiments. But people are willing to invest uh, a billion dollars to check that, which would be fine because we will obviously discover many other things together with uh, finding the relatively boring answer that W is constant. Uh, another immediate frontier is mapping hydrogen in the universe, as I described in my second lecture. And uh, here we are simply looking at the process by which the first uh, sources of light created holes in the hydrogen distribution, just like Swiss cheese. Uh, and we are trying to map the hydrogen using the resonant line of 21 centimeter. Now, let me move away from the content to the methodology. How, 
how should a young person that enters uh, cosmology or science in general uh, decide which topic to work on? And often this choice is uh, dictated by the advisor, and uh, it's not always uh, uh, following uh, a, a sufficient uh, level of information that allows the young person to, to make a, an informed judgment. And uh, I will discuss that in a few minutes. So uh, in, in describing the future, I would like to make the analogy with economics, with factors. Uh, and I divide the different topics that one can work on into categories, similarly to uh, the financial world. Uh, there are bonds that have a relatively low risk associated with them, that if you work on these topics, you are, not, uh, you are unlikely to uh, waste your time. You're, you're basically um, exploring something that everyone believes is probably correct, and you are just uh, adding some value to it, uh, but many other people are working on the same thing. And uh, the, the, of course, the, the downside is that the level of profit that you can get out of investing your time in this case, uh, or money in the case of the financial world, is not as large as if you were to take some risks. So this is the lowest risk investment of research time. And for example, precision cosmology, just improving the precision that we have on cosmological parameters belongs to that category. Uh, we are not trying to uh, take any risks here. We are just uh, reducing the error bars, the error budget. Uh, refinements on the uh, standard Lambda CDM cosmological model belongs to that category. Uh, of course, uh, um, studying uh, star formation or black hole feedback uh, are all topics that are interesting to explore, but they do not involve any risk in terms of uh, the scientific uh, content of these explorations. And by now, inflation is believed to have generated the initial conditions. There aren't really viable uh, contenders or, or candidates that uh, dispute uh, the inflationary paradigm. Uh, so constraining inflation also uh, belongs to that, that category. There is the intermediate category of stocks, where you take some risks but they are not too large. Um, I mean, they are risks relative to the other. For example, exploring whether W is a function of redshift. Um, it's quite likely that it's constant, but uh, one is willing to put research time into it just uh, because if it turns out not to be constant, then of course the benefits would be great. And so that's just like investing money in stocks. Uh, searching for the dark matter, either in the Large Hadron Collider or in the Milky Way halo, uh, is a stock investment. We don't know what the dark matter is. And so, in principle, we might not find anything. It's like searching for something based on assumptions about the properties of the dark matter particles may not lead anywhere. Uh, the same is true about other signatures of the dark matter that are related to its nature. So people are assuming the dark matter, for example, is weakly interacting, just like neutrinos, and they can calculate and predict the annihilation or decay signals that you would get from dark matter, but the dark matter may not be weakly interacting. So you are taking sex, but if you find, indeed, if you find a signal that cannot be explained otherwise, uh, the profits are, are quite large. And then, of course, there is the most risky category, venture capital, where you are taking a large risk, and of course, uh, if you are proven to be right, you will be the successor to Newton, Einstein, and so forth. Um, Fermi. Um, and so here, uh, modified theories of gravity uh, are, of course, uh, venture capital. Uh, examples include MOND, FFR gravity, and all kinds of uh, other theories that people have thought about. Uh, anthropic uh, reasoning belongs to venture capital because we don't uh, know whether it's a valid idea. We haven't visited other parts of space-time uh, where we can see if indeed the anthropic argument is relevant. Uh, assuming that there was no Big Bang or in uh, there are these cosmological models of a cyclic universe or a pyrotic universe, or assuming that the uh, constants of nature are time-dependent or space-dependent, uh, once again, uh, the likelihood is small, 
but of course, if the evidence is strong, then this would be a fundamental shift in the main paradigm of physics. And the interesting question is, when should one invest in bonds, stocks, or venture capital? The basic question that the young person is faced with. Uh, and let me illustrate it with an example. Suppose you consider dark matter or modified gravity. You are looking at uh, data, and you can explain it in two ways. Either gravity is not described uh, as uh, Newton thought or Einstein thought, or there is some hidden form of matter that accounts for the excess gravity. And the choice can be also framed in terms of omega bar, omega b, or not omega b. Okay. Is all the matter in the universe in the form of ordinary matter, or is some of it not ordinary matter? And in the context of weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs that are quite popular, uh, because they, you can work out uh, the correct value of the cosmological parameter from basic principles, um, there is this uh, diagram uh, which has on the horizontal axis the mass of the WIMP particle uh, and on the vertical axis the cross-section for its interaction. Um, and of course experiments are ruling out large cross-sections. So uh, when the limit, the upper limit on the cross-section is around here, uh, Modified gravity theories, such as MOND, can be treated as a crackpot idea. I mean, it, it's much more elegant to imagine um, a weakly interacting massive particle than to modify gravity, because there are many tests of gravity that uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity have uh, successfully um, passed. But of course, once the upper limits on the cross-section are down to the bottom of the diagram, so that in principle, WIMPs are being ruled out, then alternative theories of gravity will be an attractive alternative. And the, the choice is, of course, up to you uh, in, in terms of timing. But there is an alarming trend that I noticed when looking at the postdocs in the corridor um, at, the, at our Institute for Theory and Computation at Harvard. And I think it's uh, more general. Um, looking at uh, the way that young people uh, operate. Unlike decades ago, young researchers, especially in cosmology, are mostly investing in bonds. Uh, you don't see many young people that are exploring into the stocks or the venture capital categories. And the question is why. This definitely was not the case when I remember myself as a graduate student or as a postdoc. Um, and there are good reasons for why it is so nowadays. The first uh, most important reason is, has to do with job security and peer pressure. In particular, in cosmology, we have a standard model by now. There wasn't a standard model 30 years. So you were allowed to explore in directions that nobody else looked into. And it was completely legitimate to explore uh, strange ideas. But now we have a standard model in cosmology, so the young people feel obligated to uh, work within the context of that standard model. And also psychologically, they feel peer pressure. They realize that everyone is doing, working within that context. And, and so uh, when you, there is a religion, it's easier to be religious. Uh, when there was no religion 30 years ago, we could not uh, subscribe to any club. So peer pressure and job security uh, pushes young people in the direction of being conservative. And uh, the other effect that comes into play these days is that there are large research groups uh, with uh, predictable research agendas. The situation in astrophysics is getting closer and closer to that in, in experimental particle physics, where there are large groups of people collaborating on a project. and. The goals of the projects are well-defined because it involves uh, large amounts of money and also a large number of people. So it's not easy to deviate from the agenda uh, as it is with when you are doing your research on your own. So that's another important effect. And here I, I define large uh, in terms of the size of the group, uh, in terms of uh, the number of authors. The, the list of, if the list of authors is bigger than the abstract in a paper, that to me defines large. And, 
we, we have quite a number of papers, if you check Astro PH, that have more, a, a bigger author list than the abstract. But mainstream uh, conformism or conservatism is not a new phenomenon. I, in fact, uh, spoke with uh, Martin Schwarzschild when I was a postdoc. Um, that was uh, about 25 years ago, and I remember him saying 24 years ago, uh, he told me that in the 50s, most astronomers were working on binary stars, and conferences were filled with talks that sounded just like one another. So it was true at all times that people tend to do the same thing. Uh, but I still, I do think that it is more uh, prevalent uh, these days. And the one point I would like to emphasize is that the history of astronomy teaches us modesty. And dogmatic theories uh, often fail. And let me mention a few examples. Uh, obviously, we know the sun does not uh, move around the earth, and that was advocated by the church. And, and we thank uh, Galileo for uh, fighting that view based on the data. Um, another more uh, recent example uh, is that the universe did not exist forever. And this view was advocated by philosophers and even Albert Einstein uh, when he saw that his uh, equations um, admit naturally uh, either an expanding or a contracting solution for the universe. He introduced the cosmological constant to maintain a static universe because he wanted it to exist forever. But then he realized that this solution is unstable. And it's unstable for the reason that objects form in the universe. If you increase the density a little bit, there would be a collapse. If you reduce it a little bit, there will be an expansion, just like you get in a void. So um, indeed, the, there was a, an initial point in time, the Big Bang. And that uh, is contrary to the philosophical uh, preference for uh, a, a, a a universe that maintained the same conditions at all time. Uh, and also another even more recent example is from the 60s uh, when uh, Ricardo Giacconi proposed um, to send an X-ray telescope to space because we can't observe X-rays from the sky due to the atmosphere. We, we can't see it from the ground. We have to launch a satellite. Uh, so he proposed to NASA to send a satellite and uh, there was a panel of experts, mostly theorists back then, uh, who argued that, uh, well, we know the sun emits uh, some x-rays from it. They knew it back then. And they said, well, the most we can expect is to see other stars emitting x-rays. But that's really very, um, that, that's not uplifting. It's not particularly exciting. So there is no point in building an x-ray instrument to look at the x-ray sky, because there wouldn't be some, anything interesting. It's not worth the, the investment. And of course, in retrospect, we know that the X-ray sky is full of many sources that we haven't anticipated. So once again, uh, when we make an assumption about what the sky is like, what the universe, what reality is like, uh, without checking, we're often wrong. And, and that's what Galileo realized uh, in a very deep way. And I think people just didn't learn the lesson, even back in the 60s. And there are several reasons that uh, should teach us mod modesty at this point in time. The universe is composed of ingredients whose nature we do not un understand. So even though we are uh, studying cosmology, we think that there is a cold dark matter filling up the universe and there is a cosmological cost. It's actually surprising that we get paid because we are talking about things that we, we don't really fully understand. What is the dark matter? What is it made of? Uh, why does the vacuum have a mass density? Uh, we really have an incomplete story, and we should not then dogmatically believe that this must be the truth, because maybe there is something, some important insight that we haven't uncovered yet. Uh, we should not be conservative. Uh, the distribution of matter in the universe was not mapped uh, through most of it. Uh, we only mapped a small fraction of the volume, as I mentioned, uh, in my first and second uh, lectures, uh, the volume that we can map, um, of course, scales as the maximum distance cubed. And it would make most sense to map the matter distribution at redshifts above 5, where most of the volume is. So until we mapped most of the observable universe, we should not assume that we know the answer for the cosmology 
cosmological parameters. We have the final answer. And uh, that simply says that we should not be dogmatic for now. And the reason I address mostly young people is because they are more capable of taking uh, roads that were not taken in the past. Uh, and, and there are several reasons for that. Uh, they don't have the baggage of a prejudice. Uh, they have a flat a Bayesian prior. That's why you recruit young people to the army, because they're willing to risk their lives for some uh, imaginary ideas. Uh, they, uh, they have a flat prior and everything they're not familiar with. Uh, while older people have some prior and they don't go in directions that were not explored. And what you need to make a discovery is to go in a direction that was not explored, to take a road that was not taken. So young people have the capacity of doing that simply because they don't assume they know the answer in advance. Uh, the other thing is that senior people are distracted, distracted by administrative and fundraising concerns. They also want to maintain a conservative research profile with predictable uh, goals so that they uh, maintain their reputation. Uh, but when you are young and you don't have a reputation as of yet, there is nothing to lose. Uh, so in principle, um, young people could explore new territories. And funding agencies are often uh, driven by the agenda of senior researchers, so they are often conservative. And that is a vicious cycle by which uh, conservative people dictate the agenda and therefore everyone else becomes conservative. So uh, one criticism I heard about uh, these views that I expressed is that I can say what I say because I have tenure right now. So let me explain. Let me give a few examples of things that I did outside the mainstream when I was younger. Uh, so um, I don't think it's harmful. You can survive that. It's not a bad experience. Uh, so one example, when I was uh, a postdoc, uh, together with Andy Gould, we came up with the idea that maybe you, one can use gravitational microlensing to discover planets back in 1992. That was not thought of. And now it's actually one of the main uh, techniques for detecting the existence of planets at large distances of uh, more than kiloparsec. Um, early when I was up for tenure, uh, I started working on the first galaxies and reionization. Uh, there was no interest. I remember back in 1993, uh, there were a few people around the globe that cared about it. People didn't even think that there are galaxies at early times. They thought that they formed really rec recently. And by now, of course, this became a very important uh, frontier. And for me, it's really puzzling how come uh, there was so much resistance back in the early 90s and suddenly now it's so popular. Uh, I didn't change, uh, the, the sociology of the field changed, and there was the decadal survey back in 2010 that defined uh, the principal questions, one of which is uh, what were the first objects that light up in the universe and when did they do it? And I was not a member of that committee. So by now it became uh, one of the major frontiers for future research, and back, uh, if you go back, um, 20 years, the, nobody worked on it. So this is a lesson to learn that, that often when you go in a direction that nobody else explores, you know, it takes some time, but eventually people will follow. And then uh, after I got tenure, again, I was not worried too much, uh, and I continued to do my research. So uh, one of the papers I wrote was uh, measuring the cosmic acceleration in real time. So in other words, looking at the redshifts of galaxies, and seeing that they actually change with time because the universe is accelerating or decelerating if you look at early times. So you can actually do that, even though the time scale is 10 billion years for the universe to uh, accelerate or, or decelerate. Um, you can observe it because people developed the very sensitive techniques to see small velocity shifts when searching for planets around other stars. And just around the time when this technique was demonstrated, uh, I argued that maybe it should be applied to uh, detecting small shifts in the redshift of the Laman Alpha forest uh, in the spectra of quasars. And now it's actually a technique that is uh, um, designed uh, for the European Extremely Large Telescope, an instrument on it, a spectrograph called CODEX, 
will attempt this measurement. So it looked very uh, far uh, in terms of uh, being practical, but as it is, um, eventually it, will, it may actually uh, be done. Now, there is a disclaimer that I should uh, mention about uh, risk management, that if you were to explore new innovative ideas, most of them, you would find pretty soon that most of them fail, and, uh, or that you find that, the, that there is some Russian P60s that already did it. Um, so uh, most of the ideas that you would think of uh, either do not work or were explored in the literature. And uh, a very small fraction uh, of them actually mature to become papers. So when people ask me, well, if we look at your publication list, we find a small number of the papers that are truly innovative in directions that were not explored. The answer is that the fraction of research time that I spend on innovative ideas is much larger, but most of them do not work. So that is something that one has to keep in mind, the efficiency. Uh, and uh, failing or wasting time are a common outcome of risky investments. And people in the business world realize that. They're willing to put much more money into risky investments because they realize that if one of them succeeds, it, has, it produces huge revenues. So you, it's just a question of a, a, a calculation that you're willing to put a lot of money so that one very risky idea will bear fruit. Uh, and the other thing to keep in mind is that when you work on a new idea, often it's accompanied by loneliness. So if you go to a conference, you will not find many people that will actually sympathize with you. Uh, in contrast to the nurturing feedback that you would get if you were to um, refine the error bar on omega matter uh, a little bit, because then there would be a large community of people that will uh, speak with you, go to dinner, discuss what you've done, and so forth. So that's something to keep in mind, that when you work on new ideas, uh, you don't often get the same kind of nurturing feedback. But it's part of the experience. And if we look at the history of astrophysics and cosmology, there are examples of ideas that were venture capital that turned into stocks and eventually became bonds. And there are many examples. For example, the, the Big Bang started as uh, a speculation. Uh, Einstein uh, uh, worked on that. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, uh, the realization became uh, based on the work by uh, Henrietta Levitt and Slifer, uh, Edwin Hubble, Lemaitre, uh, that indeed the universe is expanding. And if we extrapolate the expansion backward in time, there was a point in time when everything started. And the, the real uh, final evidence came from the cosmic microwave background. And so this speculation uh, turned out to be, to be true. Um, and also the cosmic microwave background itself uh, was first uh, thought about uh, by Gamow. Uh, then it was detected ac uh, accidentally. Uh, at Bell Labs, uh, and by now it's the Rosetta Stone in cosmology. We can read off the initial conditions of the universe from the cosmic microwave background. The dark matter, once again, Zwicky uh, came across it by seeing that galaxies zoom around in a galaxy cluster faster than you would expect based on the light that you see from those galaxies. So there must be, he must be some dark matter, matter that we can't see in electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and by now, following the work of, of many uh, people, we know that uh, there is strong evidence for it. Uh, also inflation, when it was conceived in 1980, uh, it was considered a, a speculation, and the respectable uh, people did not start to work on it uh, only after a few years or so. Uh, by now, it seems to be the model for the production of the initial uh, perturbations in the universe and the flatness and, and so forth. Uh, there are also historic trends where a venture capital idea turned into a junk uh, bond, uh, something that is not worth as much. Uh, for example, steady state cosmology. 
uh, topological defects as the origin of structure in the universe, uh, dark matter, uh, assuming that it's baryonic, uh, and uh, for example, the idea that the X-ray background came from a hot intergalactic medium due to Bramshelung emission. And there was even an experiment that argued that this to be the case. Then it turned out the experiment saw just the exhaust the heat rather than the universe. Um, but um, another idea is the quintessence, that uh, the vacuum mass density is evolving relatively rapidly with, with cosmic time. So generally speaking, a venture capital idea can turn into, can, can go into the waste basket, or it can uh, become stocks and then go into the waste basket, or uh, it may mature into a bond. And so uh, there are examples for all of these arrows. The common investment strategy among uh, young postdocs right now, based on my uh, informal poll of people, is that uh, Often, young people invest 5% of their time in venture capital ideas, 15% of the time in stocks, and about 80% uh, of the time in bonds. And the reasons for that uh, were mentioned before. Uh, my recommended investment strategy for research time, uh, and that's community average. It's not for each particular person, because some people may, be, may prefer to be more conservative while others not. Here I'm talking about the community average. I would think that 20% of our resources should go in the direction of venture capital, 30% into stocks, and about 50% into bonds. And by resources, what I mean are also the, not, not just research time, but also funding from funding agencies. Now let me extend the, the analogy with the financial world a little bit farther. Uh, in physics, we have assets. These are the laws of physics that we uncover, the composition of the universe, for example, the type of particles that obey these laws. Uh, these are intellectual assets, ideas that turned out to be right based on uh, experiments. In the financial world, there are material assets, uh, for example, houses that have some value. Um, and Assets ultimately, ultimately uh, reflect hard facts, uh, but when you don't have the facts yet, uh, you have to take risks, and these, these risks are inherent in any creative activity. So if someone designs a house and builds a beautiful house, you don't know a priori the exact value of that house, but once you put it into the market, you see uh, how it values, how uh, much people are willing to give for it. Um, and a, a creative activity in physics uh, may lead to ideas that will ultimately be tested by data from experiments. So eventually we will know if these ideas have a great value or not. So the data anchors our theories to reality. Okay, so that's very important. And that's what Galileo once again emphasized. You have to get the data in order to realize whether the Earth moves around the Sun or the Sun moves around the Earth. You can't just assume that you know the truth in advance. So having the data is essential. But what happens when there are no experiments, if there are no tests uh, with data? In that case, you can get a situation like the housing bubble, where a lot of houses were valued way above their actual true value. And unfortunately, in physics, this can also happen. And I gave it a name. These are theory bubbles. And I will define them in a minute. But my question is, are there examples in physics of theory bubbles? How should we classify string theory, for example? Mario? <laughs> um, so what is the definition of a theory bubble? A theory bubble is a long period of stagnation during which talented physicists invest research time in intellectual assets whose actual value in describing nature may be low. We just don't know. These are ideas. Without testing them, we don't know. Uh, and it is caused by the lack of experimental tests over an extended period of time. 
Uh, we have this phenomenon now in physics because for a very long time there was no high energy accelerator giving us results, for example, over the past few decades. And beginning graduate students really need a rating agency, a credit rating agency of, of theoretical ideas. Uh, similar to S&P, Moody's, or Fitch in the financial world that will advise them uh, which direction to take. So, for example, there, one can imagine even a stress test. Suppose back in the 80s there was the project of the superconducting super collider and uh, that was supposed to give us new data about particle physics. But then you can ask yourself, okay, but suppose funding for that project stops. Uh, that would obviously have damaging consequences for the entire community. It turned out that was the case. The project was canceled, and then a theory bubble grew out of, out of that. So you have to take that into consideration. These are called stress tests, and you are well, well familiar with them in the context of the financial world here in Europe. So actually, I wrote uh, a year ago, I wrote this... Uh, essay and posted it on the archive uh, on rating the growth of scientific knowledge and the risk from theory bubbles. And I got, uh, and, and I, the paper, the essay was actually uh, a shortened version of it appeared in uh, Nature uh, just a few months ago. And um, I got an email from uh, Freeman Dice uh, after he read uh, the essay. And let me read you this uh, email. It says, uh, Dear Avi, I agree with you 100% and hope your idea will bear fruit. But the action has to be taken and the organization run by students, not by old people like you. And he's referring here to the idea of having a rating agency. Um, I was lucky to grow up at a time when students had no respect to elder statements. Um, the elder statesmen at that time, Heisenberg and Dirac and Bohr, Born and Schrodinger and Yukawa, and, were all pursuing fantasies that were obviously going nowhere. So we ignored the elder statesmen and went ahead using our own judgment. The students today should be doing that too. Yours ever, Freeman. So he agreed with me on that. So uh, let me define a set of rules that I think are very important in terms of selecting uh, re uh, projects. The first thing to be aware of is uh, to, to uh, be cautious of, uh, and, and careful of uh, theory bubbles where there is no foreseeable contact with experimental data. You might work your entire career on an idea that will never be tested, which could be actually tragic. I mean, in mathematics, it's completely legitimate, but physics is supposed to describe nature. There is one reality. There are many possible ideas. And so if we don't test it against reality, uh, it's not physics. Uh, the other thing is uh, one should be careful and avoid second or higher order terms in speculation theory. So, for example, MOND is supposed to be a modified theory of gravity, but then uh, a version of it includes also neutrino dark matter, and so to explain, for example, the microwave background and isotropies. And so here one uh, invokes a modification, but an additional component of dark matter on top of that. So uh, that's not economic in terms of uh, uh, speculations. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, as I already emphasized, is that the number of possible theories is unbounded. There, are, there is an infinite number of possibilities, whereas there is only one truth. So one has to be very careful not to go in directions that are um, unlikely to succeed. And the, the, the other important lesson that I've learned is that uh, progress is not linear in time. So I had uh, a student that worked for a year on a project, and then he wrote the paper, and I looked at the paper, and I, uh, looking at the introduction, I said, oh, um, why don't you uh, reference the papers that considered this, uh, s some nuance on, on, on our research topic? And he came back to me and said there were no papers looking at that. 
And I told him, oh, there were no papers? We should definitely work on that. So it turned out to be a more exciting direction to go. And then uh, we wrote a, a short paper that had a lot of impact. So when he gave a talk presenting his research, he, gave, he allocated most of the time to the first paper, which was extensive, but was not really the most exciting. And I told him, forget about the first paper. It's uh, what's, what matters the most is the discovery, the, the, the new aspect that we uncovered that was not expected. Uh, and so progress is not linear in time. Most of the time you spend on expected things, and suddenly you notice something that was not done by someone or a direction that you can take. And once you realize that, you should start a new project and forget about the amount of time that you wasted on something that is not too exciting. So that is a psychological tendency of people to just uh, uh, broadcast uh, the thing that they worked on most of the time rather than the most exciting aspect that they found at the end of the project. And um, in fact, uh, there was an article uh, back in February, just a few months ago, uh, in the New York Times that was really echoing the same ideas that I mentioned in my lecture today. Uh, the title was True Innovation by John Gertner, where he described the work at Bell Labs uh, in the middle of uh, the century, uh, around the 50s, 60s, um, where uh, a business like Bell Labs, uh, the, the upper management in that business, decided that they should have a group of people that will uh, do innovative science without any practical implications. So uh, a business organization decided that it's worthwhile taking risks, having investments in venture capital ideas, putting uh, a number of uh, excellent physicists in the same corridor and letting them be free without any agenda, uh, letting them uh, interact with each other and come with new ideas. And it's quite remarkable as to how many discoveries were made in physics within that corridor of Bell Labs that is a, a business organization. Uh, and I'll just read a few of the items from this table. Uh, for example, direct distance dialing, the laser, 1958, uh, digitized music, 1957, the first transatlantic telephone cable, 1956, uh, 1962, paging system, 1963, touchstone telephone, uh, 1962, digital transmission switching, uh, 1969, charge Apple device, CCDs, uh, 1976, fiber optic network. So everything we're familiar with in terms of phones, uh, exploration of space, internet, music, cell phones, radio, television, uh, in fact, the cosmic microwave background was discovered by people in Bell Labs. Um, so it's quite remarkable that a, a business organization was able to cultivate the culture that I'm advocating, while the scientific world these days is not. So if you look at the funding from NSF, for example, or other, other fin funding agencies, very small amount of uh, funding are allocated to... Um, innovative, risky ideas. And what I'm trying to advocate is that a small fraction that is decided upon will always be allocated to innovative ideas, and they will be uh, allocated based on uh, the track record of the investigators. So the same approach taken by Bell Labs. And here we're talking about a business, a, a money-making business, making this decision and, and resulting in important discoveries, both in physics and technology. So my conclusions are relatively simple. Senior members of selection and promotion committees should find new strategies to uh, reward creativity among young researchers. And in particular, funding agencies like NSF, for example, should allocate a fixed term of the available funds to ideas that are out of the mainstream. This happens to be very profitable in the long run. And the management of Bell Labs realized that and was correct in doing that. And so the scientific world should adopt this philosophy. If the business world realized it, why not the scientific world? And for those people that are willing to take the roads that were not taken 
Of course, I would like to encourage them. Uh, there is no point in, in doing something taking that road. And there is this famous uh, quote, quotation from uh, the poem of uh, Robert Frost, uh, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avi, as usual. Uh, very inspiring. I think I'll apply for any postdoc position now so that I can uh, use your suggestions in the future. So uh, I guess there are questions. So let's start with Emma. Yes. Well, the example, the reason I mentioned in particular the example of Bell Labs is that this is a profit-making organization that made a conscious decision that for making profits, it's actually beneficial in the long run to have a group of people doing whatever they want. Okay? And uh, when you consider the economic implications, uh, as discussed by the politicians in the UK, uh, in UK, in the, UK um, the question is on what time scale? Because uh, the business world is very much focused on getting a profit within a year or two years time scale. Uh, the scientific world actually benefits the on the long run. So Einstein's theory of general relativity is really necessary for GPS or navigating systems. Uh, and all the examples that the physicists at Bell Labs developed uh, ended up making huge profits, uh, right? Uh, but it takes decades to get that profit. So uh, if the government realizes that they want the good of the people in the long run, they have to invest in risk, t risk projects. There is no other choice because uh, that's the only way by which you can extend your current technology into new territories where, that were not explored. And, and whenever you do that, you take risks. But the idea is that uh, it's worth giving money to a large number of physicists under the expectation that perhaps one of them, like Einstein, will come up with uh, an amazing idea that will revolutionize both technology and science. And that's what the Bell Labs realized. And we see the data, we see what happened as a result of that. So it's pretty obvious that this is the right approach. But people that do not have this overarching view of, of the long-term profit, it's still profitable, but it's just that you have to wait a little more. You have to be patient. You're not talking about a year from now. But the only way to make a huge profit is to invest in the, in the distant future by allowing people to think freely and creatively and in, encourage innovative, risky projects rather than those that lead to results within a year or two. And so I think that's the mistake that politicians and scientists are making these days, that they define a profit on the short term. And that's not the right way to think about it. I know. That's right. So, the, the well, as long uh, so okay. So the reason I thought that um, time-dependent or space-dependent uh, fundamental constants are risky 
is that so far we have no hint that this is the case. And it may well be that these do change, but on such long time scales that we cannot really practically measure it. So the risk that you are taking is that you are trying to measure something that you don't know how big it is. Okay? Uh, uh, you know, it's very likely that they do change, but at a, 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 it could be at a minute level that we will never be able to measure. So the risk that, uh, I mean, you're basically setting better and better constraints on the time dependence. And the same is true about deviations from Einstein's theory of general relativity. There are people that worked on it for decades and uh, dedicated most of their career to putting constraints on general relativity. In fact, we had a conference at Harvard that I organized just a month ago on testing general relativity. And at the banquet, one of uh, the people that worked on it uh, for a long while, uh, Clifford Will, he said that probably we will never find deviations from general relativity, even if we continue to use uh, data for that. So, so the point is that deviations that you might expect, for example, in the context of general relativity will have to do with um, the interface between quantum mechanics and general relativity, but that will happen on the Planck scale, so we will never uh, be able to develop technology that will test generativity on the Planck scale. However, that's an assumption. So once again, I'm with you on that, and I think that we should, as, as we develop technology, we should put better and better constraints on possible deviations from the theories that we have. Because as you say, it might be just around the corner, so it's worth doing. Um, let me give you a little bit. Okay. Of course, you are testing, but there is no reason uh, for you. So, so, as I said, you can put better and better constraints, uh, and you can test whether your assumptions are valid to a higher and higher precision. But there is no reason for you to expect to see something, uh, right? So you are taking a risk in doing that. And the question is, I mean, you can spend your life just getting more and more digits to the precision of... So, for example, um, W that I mentioned, the, the ratio of the pressure to the mass density of the vacuum. The question is, how much money is it worth to go an extra digit in the precision? So people decided that getting a, an ex, extra factor of 10 from 10% 10 precision to 1% precision is worth a billion dollars. Going from 1% to 0.1%, is that worth a hundred billion dollars? I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe there is nothing. There is no change, and then we can invest trillions of dollars and nothing will be found. So, so there is uh, a point where you say to yourself, okay, uh, I'm not willing to, give more, to invest more money or more time in just getting tighter and tighter constraints. Let me go in another direction and explore a different problem. More questions? Stefania. Oh, you're talking about the Higgs. Um, so in particle physics, you're asking what would be... I think the nature of the dark matter, if we do find, for example, people are reporting about the electromagnetic signatures that are unusual these days, uh, from Fermi, for example. Um, if any of them turns out to be right, then of course we might be on the verge of detecting annihilation products of the dark matter. Uh, if we do find that, then it's a contribution to particle physics, but also to our understanding of the universe. And there are hints that there might have been something wrong with our understanding of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the lithium abundance, for example. Um, and perhaps, you know, there is something in cosmology that we haven't yet figured out. So I, I, I don't know, but uh, there could also be very um, 
unexpected sources on the sky that are time dependent. People imagined in the past superconducting cosmic strings. There could be some. Uh, so that's why I'm saying opening a new window in the context, for example, of gravitational wave astrophysics will definitely allow us to reveal, uh, to, to find sources that we haven't imagined in the past. It's not just the black hole binaries that we are imagining. You're opening a new window and you have to look through that window to see what's out there. And often you discover new things. And what the mistake that we are making is similar to what NASA did back in the early 60s. They said, we can figure out from theoretical considerations what the X-ray sky looks like. But once they decided to build an X-ray satellite, they immediately found lots of sources, black hole binaries, uh, X-ray binaries, um, um, and, and the clusters of galaxies, all active galactic nuclei. So um, the lesson from that is that we should be modest. We should not pretend that we know the truth. And we should advance uh, as much as possible the instrumentation that we use uh, in looking at the sky. So, if we can open a new window into gravitational wave astrophysics, to me, it's much more exciting than trying to refine the precision on W. But that's not the popular view right now. The funding agencies are willing to fund, uh, uh, at the same cost, a, a project that has better precision on W than to fund LISA uh, that will open a new window into the universe. Okay. Uh and Marcos Antonino and then Guido. Marcos. So the, the, the experience we have from the past is that the more discoveries we have, uh, the more questions we have for making new discoveries in the future. So in fact, uh, having knowledge allows you to make, uh, to explore new territories even better and opens new avenues for research. So it's, it, it, it's exactly the opposite from inhibiting future progress. Uh, uh, and so I don't think conservatism follows from knowing uh, more. In fact, knowing more allows you to define more exciting directions to go into. So it has the opposite effect. Uh, I do think that it has uh, sociological roots, that uh, people... Uh, tend to operate um, as a group, uh, uh, the herd mentality. And um, senior, senior researchers uh, cultivate that culture because senior people, uh, uh, they want a lot of other people to do the same thing that they do. Okay? So they want the young people to follow their research agenda, just like Freeman Dyson was pointing out. Um, and uh, they also want to protect their reputation so they will not pursue ideas that deviate too much from the path that has proven to be right in the past. And the last thing is biologically, I think, older people tend not to be as creative as younger people, just like in sport, you know. Uh, and that has to do some with the baggage of uh, knowledge because older people tend to derive their expectations from what they know already. So they, while younger people are willing to dare and imagine things that perhaps most of which are not true, so they go in directions that do not work, but every now and then they go in a direction that works that what nobody else dared to explore. So that, I think, is the root of, of the phenomenon. In my opinion, are, are 
intelligent life as it has evolved on the Earth, as we know it, is the result of evolution amongst many, many, many alternatives, and not directly by physics. So I wonder if you can uh, give us your insight in this. Yes. Um, so in my view, um, biology away from the Earth is the most exciting topic in astrophysics in the distant future. Uh, because we are likely to find uh, things that we haven't imagined yet. Um, now, um, more to your question. Um, what um, we often tend to do is uh, assume that the extraterrestrial intelligence is just, just like us. Or uh, like us during a particular period of time. And my view is that we should not have prejudice because we are probably wrong, just like you said. Uh, and so what we should do is explore, just like Christopher Columbus. I mean, he had to get the money from the Queen by convincing her that there are practical implications to his journey, right? And so we have to convince the funding agencies Yes, uh, we have to convince the funding agencies that we are taking that journey. We will explore biology away from the Earth, perhaps with some practical benefits. But the truth of the matter is that we really want to explore, meaning that we go without a prejudice and see what is out there. Okay? And in that sense, I think we should be open-minded. We should have a flat prior no assumption about what biology away from the Earth is. It may not be ba based, for example, on the chemistry associated with water, just life as we know it. Intelligent life may be very complicated, very different than, than we are. And so the, the trick is to use the technology that we have at any point in time to the best of our ability to search for possible signals. And that means not assuming that the signals are intentional and follow the logic that we use. And so if, for example, we can search for intelligent signals within the solar system with existing telescopes, let's just go ahead and do it without saying that you know, it's unlikely. If we can do the same thing way outside of the solar system, let's just do it. And uh, now the more likely situation, if you ask uh, what is the conservative view that you might adopt, is to say, Primitive life probably exists in many, many places, many of the planets that I showed. But intelligent life may be less likely. However, we don't know how to quantify that. We have one data point ourselves. Uh, we need a, at least one more data point. If we have two data points, it will help a lot. Three would be fantastic. So how do we find extra data points? We just explore. And I think uh, if, for example, we have the MWA and LOFAR, and they are giving us data about the radio sky. Let's not, let's not throw data. Let's examine it, invest 10% or a few percent of the research uh, 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 resources and, and just check if there is any signal due to uh, radio transmission from, from our galaxy. Okay. Uh, probably we will find that there is nothing, but we haven't you know, we are just piggybacking on an existing project. So in, we are not investing new funds in this case. But maybe like Columbus, we will territory that we haven't imagined, and we will discover America. Um, so it, I think we should repeat this uh, on every technology that we develop, and until we find something that we haven't expected. And the mistake that is often made by scientists is to say, I know what I should expect, and I don't want to look anywhere else. Okay, we have a, maybe the last question by Guido.
Yes, so the issue of technology is very important, of course, um, uh, and um, it's a question of judgment. And one way to deal with it is uh, to define uh, a long-term trajectory. Basically say, we really want to open this window of gravitational wave astrophysics, to open this window into the universe. So let's define a set of milestones. The first step would be to demonstrate the technology. And there is a pathfinder to LISA. Technology is demonstrated. Or if we are able to uh, extrapolate beyond the technology that exists right now in a straightforward manner, once we reach that point, we should definitely fund it. Then that's a fine decision. But the current status is that there is no future to this, uh, to this field beyond the pathfinder. It's not as if uh, one says, OK, um, if the pathfinder is successful, if this and that being demonstrated, we will move forward. That should be the right approach. And I completely agree with you. We always have to wait until the technology is demonstrated. But at the same time, we should have long-term goals. Why do we want the technology to be demonstrated? Because we think that opening a new window into the universe is extremely important. And that part of the, of the calculation is not really uh, advertised broadly. Yes, second comment? Yes. So, so let, me, let me give you an example. Uh, so for example, um, in terms of telescope time, let me uh, now talk about observations. Uh, one can, in principle, allocate a small fraction of telescope time in, in uh, time allocation committees to risky projects or things that were not anticipated or something that has not been explored. And that, on some telescopes, is done routinely. Right? The, there is a fraction of the time allocated to very risky projects. You can do the same thing on theoretical projects. And it's just a question of uh, uh, being uh, uh, generous. And uh, just like Bell Labs were, giving salaries to a bunch of physicists without telling them what to do. You know, it's worth doing that because in the long run you benefit. Rather than keeping everyone on a tight budget with well-defined goals, knowing in advance what you're about to discover. There, the profits will be lower because everything is predictable. And my point is, if you want to maximize profits for the investment of funds, you should give people freedom. Yes, That's having a fixed structure for that would be great. And if you can right. Let us know your rate of success. <laughs> yeah, so I think the culture has to change, and people have to accept the possibility of failing, because the issue is really that most of the time when you take risks, you fail. But that's legitimate. You should not feel bad about it. You didn't waste money. Uh, most of, I'm sure that there were lots of ideas that came across in that corridor in Bell Labs that failed. And <coughs> nobody uh, cares about it in the long run because the small, num the small fraction of work give you much more profit than if none of these ideas came into existence.
So. Okay, I, I think uh, we can continue this very lively discussion over the cocktail that we will have. You're all invited to join us. And so you have also the chance to continue your discussion with Avi. But wait a second, before we, we break, uh, we are, this is the last uh, lecture. So I'd like to remind you a couple of things. The first is that all the videos of the lectures are uh, already, or well, the first three uh, on our uh, website at the Cathedra Galileana webpage of the Scuola Normale and also on the YouTube uh, channel of the Scuola Normale so you can uh, see them for the rest of the uh, cosmic time. <laughs> and uh, uh, so Avi, as I said, will be here until tomorrow. So this is the last day. And he also has very uh, nicely agreed to uh, give us all the PDF files of the lectures, which will also be uh, on the same page. So you have all the material is there, so you can go back and check it all the time. And finally, uh, because I know how much effort and uh, patience uh, Avi has put into this uh, lecture that turned out a big success, uh, as I, I uh, already know, uh, I'd like to thank him very deeply and uh, hope they'll come back soon to tell us more. Thank you so much. Thank you.